All right. May I please the court? Council. After 6 p.m. Friday the 13th of May 2016 when Robert Hayes knocked on the door of apartment number one at 1133 South Shelby Street. He knocked on the door but nobody answered. He walked to the front of the building. The building was locked. He went back to apartment one and continued knocking. Again, no answer. He put his hand on the doorknob and wiggled it. To his surprise, the door came open. He stepped foot inside, and in the small one-bedroom apartment, he walked back toward the bedroom. Robert was not prepared for what he saw next. Jennifer Kane laid on the bedroom floor in a pool of her own blood. All color had left her body. She was as still as a mannequin. Her boyfriend, Daryl <coughs> Wilson, laid a few feet away from her on their bed, on his back, bleeding profusely out of his head. His body appeared lifeless. Robert looked around, and he saw Daryl take a shallow breath. Daryl's chest rose. It startled Robert. It was a scene out of a nightmare. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen of the jury. The 911 call came at 6.20 p.m. on Friday the 13th, May 2016. Robert Hayes, his fiance, Tanya Taylor, and a friend of Jennifer Kane's Michael Mead, who goes by Mike, went by 1133 South Shelby Street to check on Jennifer. She was supposed to start a job at noon that day, but she had never shown up. They were concerned. Robert knew about this job as he's the one that got it for her. She was supposed to start working for his father. Robert had even stopped by the apartment around lunchtime earlier in the day. His fiance Tanya Taylor, had some concerns because nobody had heard from Jennifer all day long, and they all spoke to her regularly, but nobody was able to get a hold of her. Robert, who also owns the building at 1133 South Shelby Street, he is the landlord and the maintenance man, he had a key to the back door. He went inside, and he knocked on the door of apartment number one, where Jennifer lived. Again, no answer. Around noon, he thought, Maybe she overslept. Maybe she's out somewhere. Around noon, it was not a big deal that she was nowhere to be found. But by 6 p.m., their concerns had started to rise, and rightfully so. Officer Christopher Maybody was patrolling the area when the 911 phone call came in. It took him less than a minute to respond to 1133 South Shelby Street. He walked into the apartment and discovered the same ghastly scene that Robert saw just minutes before. EMS and homicide were immediately notified, and Detective Rick Burns was one of the first homicide detectives on scene. And you'll hear that the homicide squad works as a team. They all have a job to do. Detective Burns learned that there are two apartments inside of 1133 South Shelby Street. Apartment number one is occupied by Jennifer Kane and her boyfriend, Daryl Wilson. And the second apartment, apartment number two, is occupied by Jody Cecil and Brian Greenwell. But nobody had seen the occupants of apartment number two. Ms. Cecil and Mr. Greenwell were nowhere to be found. 
The front of the building, this front door, is a secured entrance. That door has its own key. That door remains locked. And when Robert got to the scene, that front door was locked. He informed Detective Burns of this, and they could only come to one conclusion. Whoever did this horrific crime had access. They had a key. Detective Brian Royce was off duty when he got the call that he would be assigned as the lead, as the lead investigator on this case. He arrived at 1133 South Shelby at about 723 p.m., so about an hour after the 911 phone call came in. Daryl Wilson had already been taken to the hospital by EMS, but Jennifer's body was still there. The crime scene unit responded. You'll hear, you'll hear them as CSU. Um, he and the crime scene unit walked through the front door. This is the door to apartment number one. They walked in. And the place was in disarray. There was candle wax on the floor. Things were tossed around. Things were broken. The place was a mess. Daryl's belongings, Daryl Wilson's belongings, were next to the front door in a bin. But as they kept walking through, they got to the back bedroom and they discover Jennifer Kane's body. Initially, the scene had appeared like one of a murder-suicide. We have a female that is deceased and her boyfriend, who is still alive. But quickly, Detective Royce's investigation would reveal that that was impossible. There were no weapons in the bedroom. There was no weapon near Daryl. There was no weapon near Jennifer. The scene told them that this was nothing less than murder. As Detective Royce walked through the apartment, he entered the bedroom. Jennifer laid there in a pool of her own blood, bleeding profusely from her head. She had three gunshot wounds to the left side of her face. Her hands were covered in blood. We would later learn that that blood on her hands was Daryl Wilson's. She probably tried to help. Her bloody hands did not have anything next to them. No guns, no knives, no sticks, no weapons at all. She laid next to this computer hard drive. Detective Royce took note of the spray of the blood on the hard drive. He carefully examined it and inside he discovered a projectile. On the other side of her head, he discovered a shell casing. The shell casing was collected by the crime scene unit and would later be tested against the murder weapon and found to be a match. But this scene told the story of the last moments of Jennifer Kane's life. Detective Royce continued through the tightly spaced bedroom now, Jennifer Kane's body is at the foot of the bed on this side. The bed was covered in blood. One large spot in particular, here in the middle, revealed where Daryl had laid, bleeding out of the back of his head. Around Daryl, there are blood-soaked rags, as if Jennifer had tried to help. Finally, through the mattress, there is a bullet hole. The bullet hole went through the mattress, the box spring, 
through the carpet and lodged itself in the corner and the floor. That projectile was recovered. Again, no weapons on the bed or anywhere nearby. At this point, Detective Royce knows that he has a murder on his hands. But no suspects and no sign of Jennifer and Daryl's neighbors, the defendants, Jody Cecil and Brian Greenwell. Meanwhile, at the hospital, Daryl Wilson is fighting for his life. He suffered one gunshot wound to the top back of his head that left so much damage, EMS technicians did not know whether this was an entrance or an exit wound. Daryl was not mobile and could not speak. They didn't know if he was going to live or die. At that point, the only person that could tell them what happened inside of that bedroom did not have a voice. Days and weeks went by, nobody came forward. No information on the case. And still, no sign of Jody Cecil or Brian Greenwell. They had not returned to their apartment. It's not until June 2nd, 2016, that Homicide gets a little more information on this case. June 2nd, John Pickard, a maintenance man, goes in to clean up apartment number one. Um, they had to take the carpet out. They had to bleach the floors. They had to get rid of all of the blood that contaminated that scene before they could rent it back out. While they are cleaning, while they are in that bedroom of apartment number one, they're scrubbing the floor where there's a big blood spot where Jennifer's body laid, and something pops out of the floor, a projectile. Immediately, they back up and they call the police. They call the police and they say, we think this is important, you guys need to come out here. And they do. At the same time, they had also been cleaning apartment number two. Jody Cecil's lease was up at the end of May and since she had not returned, maintenance went ahead and entered the apartment and started cleaning it out, preparing to rent this place out to new tenants. Inside of the apartment, clothing, valuables, and other personal belongings were left behind, as if somebody left in a rush. Detective Royce instructed the crime scene unit to collect some Coke cans um, that were inside of apartment number two. The reason why he did that is because at this point, he still does not have a suspect. He's got his suspicions, but he has no firm evidence. He needs to confirm who was inside of apartment number two. So these cans are collected. They're sent off to the crime scene unit. They're sent off to a latent print um, examiner. She gets some prints off of the cans, and they are confirmed to belong to Brian Greenwell. Brian Greenwell was inside of apartment number two. Again, no action on the case for a few weeks until June 20th, 2016. Detective Royce gets information that Daryl Wilson has regained his consciousness. He is now awake. He is awake, but he can't speak. He's paralyzed from the neck down. <clears throat> and still does not have a voice. Detective Royce goes out to the care facility and he conducts an interview with Daryl. An interview 
where Daryl gave answers by blinking and raising his eyebrow because of the damage that Brian Greenwell and Jody Cecil did to his body. But in that interview, Daryl is able to let Detective Royce know that the people responsible for Jennifer's murder and for his injuries are his neighbors, Jody Cecil and Brian Greenwell. It's not until July 19th, a month later, that Detective Royce comes into contact with Jody Cecil and Brian Greenwell. He interviews them both. Jody Cecil is interviewed first. Judge, may we approach this? Yes. Yeah. 